Okay, so uh, I was just saying that um, we have a couple of quick updates today. One is um, that I got the um, major paths for the um, Pi to row direct and the row combinator compiling. <clears throat> um, so that uh, I still have work to do, but that the, the bulk of the code is now uh, complete. Um, there's the, the dog, look. so you can go directly from pi to row, uh, or you can go from pi to uh, the Yoshi to combinators, and then to row, uh, and that those paths are not um, not done yet. Um, they're relatively straightforward to do, uh, but they I haven't I haven't done those yet. But I just wanted to um, just show folks what I mean in terms of uh, you know here's if I just do a a, a uh, fresh. Uh, check out of the project, right? So the project's now checked out. I cd into rowcom. I do an SBT compile. <coughs> uh, is it possible to use JFlex uh, directly inside the project with SBT and not as the dependency? Global dependency. It's possible, I think. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think so. Uh, anyway, so you can see that it compiles without errors. Um, so, so still, still some work to do, uh, and I need to do some testing. But uh, by and large, uh, that code is now complete. Uh, there's a one place in the paper that I need to. Where I notice I have a typo, I'm I'm using p instead of q, which is the parameter being passed in. Uh, so I need to go back and fix that. But uh, overall, um, that is now um, now doable. Um, uh, so uh, so then we can um, uh, I'll update uh, the um, archive paper. Uh, to mention that we have an implementation. And that here's the implementation. Uh, and uh, and uh, also run some key examples so people can see the translations. Um, so any questions about that? So, so uh, the paper is published? The Rocom paper? Uh, the, we're, we're giving a talk whenever places is reconvened. Uh, and um, we have a preprint on archive uh, publication. Publication will um, uh, will follow, um, you know, hopefully in the not too distant future. Oh, nice. Yeah. And uh, for 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 your workshop uh, now now it's delayed, right? Or yeah, it's been delayed. That's correct. Uh, did you did you plan maybe some some kind of uh, online? Well, they haven't planned it online. Um, I, I, I would hope that, I think they still want to, they're still holding out for uh, an in the fall um, thing. Mm. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, those are, those are, those are good questions. And then uh, we have also, I've also um, um, updated the uh, uh, ladle paper to include the um, the extra uh, meta variable context in the type judgment rules, it doesn't change our type judgment rules. Um, <coughs> so let me just sh show what I'm talking about here. Um, so now there are two turnstiles. So there's like uh, a double bar on the left and a single bar. Um, so the um, uh, to the right of the single bar is the term assignment that you're expecting. Um, so for example, here we're, we're expecting that T is of type tau. Um, and uh, gamma is going to be a list of um, uh, variable names and their types. And then to the left of this one is going to be meta variables and their types. 
So the reason that the typing rules themselves don't have any meta variables is because um, we're not doing things like beta reduction in these typing rules. Uh, so we would use that for beta reduction or uh, the com rule, right? So that, that will show up in the graph rules, but not in the, um, uh, but not in the, the typing judgments themselves. So um, uh, what, what this does is the, uh, this extra machinery allows us to um, expand the application of the, um, of the type, type system to calculate with variables that, you know, and, you know, that have binders. Um, so like with Lambda, you have abstraction. With Pi, you have a form of abstraction. Uh, and so on. So the variables with binders um, uh, uh, um, mechanism it can be um, modeled by what's called second order algebraic theories. Uh, so essentially, you know, we're still maintaining, you know, a careful connection with, uh, with the Lavier theories and monodicity. We've just added um, uh, added uh, 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 some exponential objects um, that handle the um, that handle the the, the name binders. Um, so so just a little bit of background so that isn't just a gobbledygook for some folks. Uh, so ladle stands for logic as a distributive law. A distributive law is. Um, is essentially talking about how two monads distribute over each other. The two monads in question are collections, um, which say um, how you gather up the terms that inhabit the type. So if we think about uh, uh, terms inhabiting types, what we're saying is that a particular uh, program, a term, um, uh, is can be type checked as as um, satisfying a particular type, and so when a program satisfies a type, we say that it inhabits the type. It's in the set of programs that that are witnesses um, for the type or proofs that the type is not empty. Uh, so that's that's where that language comes from. Um, and so, so the, the question is, when you collect those witnesses, when you collect those terms that satisfy the type, what kind of collection is that? Um, now, in general, um, because we're talking about distributive laws, um, there are uh, no-go theorems that mean that the collections have to be very, very set-like. <laughs> um, if, if the collections are not commutative, um, then there are, there are problems with doing distribution. So uh, more on that later. Um, <clears throat> so um, the, other, the other monad uh, is the, the thing that generates the programs themselves. So, so uh, for example, the grammar for lambda calculus or the grammar for rho calculus, uh, those, those grammars have, a, uh, you know, have the ability to generate all the terms in that language. And they correspond to a monad. So um, another way to express those grammars is as um, certain kinds of algebraic theories. So the row combinators and SKI fall under what's called uh, Lavier theories. Um, so uh, we, uh, um, so there's a correspondence between monads and Lavier theories, um, but uh, Lavier theories do not have the power to capture binders. Um, so there's a, there are, there are a couple of different ways to approach this. One is with the um, the nominal uh, st stuff that uh, uh, Gabay and Pitts developed, uh, and and Clouston showed that you could extend this 
um, to um, what are called nominal Lavier theories. Uh, what is missing in his in Clauston's account is the monadicity. Right. So the question the question is, you know, do you still have a correspondence between nominal Lavier theories and a monad? Um, and then there's the um, second order algebraic theories, uh, and in this case, there may be a correspondence to Lavier theories. Uh, I mean, uh, to monads. Uh, there probably is, I just don't know what it is right now. I'll have to ask Mike about that. That, that particular area is, uh, or Mike or Christian, it's not, it's not my area of expertise. So I'd have to go and see if, see what, uh, uh, what, what's going on there. But the machinery is considerably simpler. Um, so that's the reason that we've, we've chosen it. Um, uh, so that gives us uh, that gives us the ability to um, model uh, the, uh, the 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 binder capability. So that's what that's what we've got. And that um, once we're once we've uh, finished with all of that work, um, then we will have a complete categorical semantics that includes the binding capability uh, for the ladle. Uh, construction, which means that in the paper, in addition to the examples that for SKI and for row combinators, we'll also do examples for lambda and for uh, the row calculus itself. Uh, and uh, that will essentially complete the program. It will be done. Uh, I mean, there are still lots and lots of fun and interesting things to look at, uh, but that uh, that is um, the major, that's the bulk of the work. It, it will be um, whole and complete. Um, so any questions about that? Awesome. Um. <coughs> uh, yeah, I, I have a question, although I'm, I'm not sure that I can, um, uh, I can, I can like say it uh, correctly. Uh, uh, if if we can compare uh, categorical representation, uh, so uh, now with uh, with uh, Jake and then. Uh, we are talking about Cartesian closed categories for sure. representing the, the language. So we're, I'm, I'm not sure. Can you're representing lambda calculus? Cartesian uh, closed categories are not will not suffice, for example, to represent um, the pi calculus, for example. Okay. Okay. You answered my question. Thanks. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So so um, so so the second order algebraic theories are weaker than. Um, uh, Cartesian closed categories. So, so in order to model the Lavier theories, you have to have uh, co-products. Uh, oh, sorry, products. You have to have products, not co-products. Yeah, you have to have products, um, but you don't necessarily have uh, uh, um, Cartesian. But, but with our second order, I mean, uh, uh, closed closedness. Um, so with second order uh, algebraic theories, you have um, some exponential objects, maybe not, maybe not all of the ones that you might need, but you've got some exponential objects. So uh, for those people who don't know category theory, um, a Cartesian closed means that you've got um, both um, products, that's the Cartesian part, and closed means you have um, you're able to turn um, the, all the home sets, all the all the um, gadgets that uh, represent the morphisms between any two objects into an object itself. So this happens, for example, with vector spaces. So if you have a couple of vector spaces and you consider all the linear functions between the vector spaces, that 
that thing itself is also a vector space. And you can do that point-wise. Um, so similarly with, um, uh, with Scott domains, if you have uh, the lambda, you know, all the lambda terms and you consider all the functions from lambda terms to lambda terms that are, that are um, uh, you know, continuous or computable, then that is also a lambda domain. Right, so it's basically, you know, can you turn the function space gadget into, into, um, uh, uh, you know, an element of the thing itself? And um, so, so we we uh, we have this. Uh, uh, we instead of having all of them, we throw in um, some number of exponential objects. Um, so, for example, in the case of rho, uh, you don't need, um, you don't necessarily need p to the p, but you do need um, uh, n to the p. So that's a so take a name, give a give a process. So that's that's a one. Um, one way to deal with the, the binder capabilities. Uh, hopefully that was clear. Can you say a little more about uh, this last part and and to the P and? Yeah, sure. I mean, you just you need, you need to be able to to model um, functions. You know, whatever 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 your binders are, right? So, in the case of the four comprehension. Um, Um, oh, you mean enter enter the p as a, as a binder? That, uh, yeah, it models a binder. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Mm. See. So did I say that right? I think I, I think I mean p to the n. Yeah, p to the n. Anyway, I always get dyslexic about that. Um, okay, so. Um, Oh, the the, yeah, the the point is you you have enough um, gadgets to model whatever your whatever your binding constructs are, uh, and they are going to be modeled as functions. But you have to be like one of the things that's a really tricky is with these kinds of systems you don't want to um, you don't want to model these things by you don't want to model the computational dynamics by equations. <clears throat> you want to model the, the computational dynamics by the rewrite rules. Uh, if you model them by equations, then you lose a whole bunch of important information. So modding out by beta reduction is exactly why full abstraction for PCF fails. You have to not mod out by beta reduction. Um, so in the case of ladle, you know, what we're suggesting is to, to your term, you build your term theory on top of a theory of graphs and those, those graphs have, uh, <coughs> um, um, <coughs> have a, uh, <coughs> pardon me, um, model the rewrite rules. So it's a different approach than the Sobosinski, Sassoni, and Klen, or um, some of these other approaches, which are modeling the rewrites, uh, you know, or the Milner-Leifer approach, where they're they're modeling it in terms of um, uh, morphisms. So we're we're looking at um, it's not. I mean, Christian. Uh, Christian Williams and John Bias looked at um, graph enrichment. So you enrich the HOM set with a structure of a graph. Uh, and we, uh, so we're looking at a, it's, it's not technically a categorical notion of enrichment, but we're, we're taking the same idea, but the way we model it is by, uh, by putting it over in the theory side as opposed to in the HOM set side. So that's uh, slightly different, but it's a little bit more practical in the, in the sense that 
we then have a language of source and target, which corresponds to what we expect from SOS rules. Right, so if you look at the presentations of the, uh, you know, calculi like the lambda calculus or the pi calculus uh, or the rho calculus, they're presented in terms of uh, structure operational semantics rule format, um, where, you know, very similar to these type judgment rules, you have a, you know, um, uh, you express your if then else uh, in this numerator denominator format. And the, the top rule says what the state uh, looks like at the beginning and the bottom, the bottom of the rules says what the rewrite looks at, like at the end. So essentially the top is the source and the bottom is the target. Um, or, um, or sometimes it'll be more like, here's the hypothesis and then the left-hand side at the bottom and the right-hand side is the source and the right-hand side is the bottom, like in the, um, in the, uh, in the com rule, right? So in the com rule, um, you don't have any hypothesis, but you do, so there's, there's nothing necessary to discharge at the top. But you know that if you have on the left-hand side a, a, a par and, you know, where something is listening on X and the other thing is sending on X, then it rewrites to the communication of the data over the X channel and the evolution of the process with the substitution. Uh, so that's, um, or in the case of um, the par rule, as opposed to the com rule, you know, the hypothesis is that P goes uh, from P to P prime, uh, then you have that um, P par Q goes to P prime par Q prime. Right. So that's, that, that gives you a sense of the format of the rules, how they, how they fit together. Um, so modeling that format, you need the, the, um, the source and target machinery. So that's uh, part of the reason why we do that. Um, okay, so that's kind of the, uh, the update for today. Any other questions? Can I can I ask something not uh, totally related? But uh, I was I was listening uh, uh, Stephen Wolfram about uh, he was mentioning uh, computational uh, irreducibility and uh, principle of all of computational equivalence. And uh, he was he was also talking about uh, cellular automata as uh, as the something that can evolve in more, more complicated uh, computation. So, uh, can we somehow uh, answer these questions from, from a legal perspective? Uh, sure, so first of all, um, the biggest problem with automata, uh, cellular automata, is that they're not particularly composable. So if I have two cellular automata, right, two different sets of rules, how do I combine them? Um, and that becomes really important if we want to do any kind of analysis of the system, because we also don't, we, we don't want to just combine them, we want to decompose them. <clears throat> and the kind of the whole point of this framework is to be able to answer questions just like that. <clears throat> so if you, at the very outset of, of this paper, what we assume about the, about the input, the theory, what we insist on in, the, in, the, in this work is um, that um, the theory, uh, it, the model of computation is compositional. So, um, you know, so we demand 
that um, what, whatever you give us, it's got to have a, uh, a model of computation where you've got some notion of composition represented by K and it's the composition that describes how things evolve. So for example, in the case of um, the row calculus, the composition operator is the par. And because you have two things interacting, then you get an evolution, right? Or likewise with lambda calculus, the composition is application. So K is application. And um, when we apply a function to its arguments, then we get the substitution of the arguments for the variables, right? That's beta reduction. So this is composition, this is composition. Um, and uh, it, it is not clear, uh, um, and by the way, um, it's not just that this is how um, things work in computing. If you look at chemistry and the notation of chemistry, it's also about composition. Right. Yeah. Uh, so if I mix some hydrogen together with some oxygen in the right proportions, then I can get some water. Right. And that mixing is the, the plus of, of uh, the chemical equations. But we can have more dimensions um, in, in composition to cellular phenomenon in terms of, you know, uh, cre creating ambience or, or uh, it becomes a, 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 an ambient model where you have uh, the interactions that are happening within some uh, uh, bounds. Right. All I'm saying, I mean, you could do something similar with Turing machines. You could modify the theory of Turing machines to give a compositional account. But the but the original theory of Turing machines as put forward by Alan Turing is not compositional. Even though he fundamentally relies on composition in order to, to prove, to, to address the halting problem. Right? So he, right. he, he needs a notion of composition, but it's not present in the theory. So that's a, that's a, a flaw in um, uh, Turing's argumentation. Um, if, if his argumentation would be many times better, it would be a cleaner system if he had addressed that issue. Um, instead, the, that part of the argumentation is, is above or outside of the formal system. <clears throat> Likewise, with the, with the cellular automata, it is possible uncertain to develop compositional notions of cellular automata. Um, to the best of my knowledge, Wolfram has not proposed any. Yeah. Um, and without composition, uh, it is impossible to address the kinds of issues of scale that Wolfram wants to address. In particular, What's really important is to be able to talk about decompositions of the sorts of objects that uh, Wolfram wants to study. Um, so looking at objects in terms of their components. And this is, this is, this is just, you know, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just math, right? I and mean, this, is, this is how math works, right? If you look at group theory, the part of the reason why people were so excited about various kinds of groups was because they were classifying all the building blocks of groups. So if they, if they knew all the building blocks of the groups, then they could, they could if you handed someone a group, then um, with a small amount of analysis, they could determine its structure because they could say, well, you know, is it, is it one of these building blocks? Okay, it isn't. Okay, therefore it has to be some composition of those building blocks, All right? That's, that's kind of the whole idea of all of this stuff. 
decomposing things into their prime components. So you understand the prime components and then you understand how they're fit together. Now, um, the principle of computational equivalence, um, so he doesn't talk about what that means in terms of how computer science thinks about <laughs> computational equivalence. So um, we're, we, have to, we have to figure out what, what Wolfram means. Uh, and the principle of um, computational irreducibility, again, um, he doesn't talk about that in the language of computer science. So we have to, we have to sort of go and figure out what he means in his own private language. So um, you, have you uh, looked at, uh, I'm looking at Wolfram's article, uh, finally we may have a path to the funding. Yeah, I, I, I read it over. Yeah, he, he doesn't talk about uh, how how to decompose this uh, yeah. bigger uh, execution of uh, of applying all, all all of these simple rules. That's exactly uh, right. And and, and, it's, it's, and, and, and in fact, um, we know lots and lots and lots about um, those kinds of compositions. I mean, um, uh, the guy who did K framework. Um, uh, I don't remember his name right now. Gregory, Gregory Russo, Russo. Yeah, thank you. That's that's the one. Um, so even his uh, his uh, his um, rewriting logic um, talks about you know certain kinds of com combinations of rewriting systems, um, and that. That's a beginning to understand um, <coughs> the uh, the way in which you might combine cellular automata. Likewise, um, uh, the um, uh, Neil Ghani and uh, and uh, some of his colleagues have looked at uh, uh, the combination of rewrite systems from a monadic perspective. So that's uh, that's um, th those are two different approaches to looking at how we might combine uh, cellular automata because cellular automata are ju literally just rewrite systems. Uh, so the same the same thing would apply to the graphic lambda calculus, right? That's right. The graphic lambda lambda calculus is a rewrite system. That's correct. And well, it's local. It has uh, emergent composition though <laughs> no it has a very straightforward composition right it's got application it, application is its notion of composition uh, and, and also obviously you can form land abstraction and other things but the but the point the point I'm making is that if Wolfram knew a little bit more computer science um, then he could look at some of the more fundamental questions <coughs> which are still missing <coughs> pardon me uh, allergies are bad today um he could look at some of these fundamental questions uh, with respect to um uh, uh the kinds of objects that he wants to study that, and, and we've known about them right i mean the, the the whole point of concurrency um and analyzing that in a rewrite setting um, is because we immediately see where there are uh, potential resource con uh, contention and that shows up in rules, right? So for example, if you have um, a particular cell, uh, which is by the way, going to be adjacent um, on, uh, to other cells on four sides in a square-like grid. So you could have a rule that you know uh, applies uh, to a cell that's adjacent to the top and a cell that's adjacent to the bottom. Uh, and so now you have the contention: which rule wins? Right? That's a race condition. 
right? And these, uh, or in, in, in Wolfram's case, he was, he stopped looking at automata and was just looking at rules on relations, like the rewrites of relations. Well, we know a lot about uh, rewrites on relations and you can certainly have those kinds of contentions on relations. Uh, so that's something that's very interesting and worth studying. Uh, and we know a lot about it, <laughs> it turns out. And that will, that will all, uh, having that understanding as a part of his basic presentation will aid in his job because it will, uh, it would give him uh, um, a whole raft of machinery uh, to, um, to decompose um, the objects that he's studying into, um, their, uh, into their bits and thereby decompose the dynamics. I mean, that's the interesting point and that's sort of what makes the lambda calculus and the row calculus and the pi calculus and the ambient calculus, uh, all, of, all of these kinds of calculi so interesting is because you have um, a um, structure function relationship. So I've, I've spoken about this many, many times before, but the, the, uh, the issue with the, a language like Java or JavaScript is that you cannot look at what's the code that's in front of you and know what it does. You have to have in your mind the, the additional state of an environment or a virtual machine or some combination thereof. <coughs> so the programmer who is reasoning about their code is always also reasoning about stuff that's not on the page. Whereas with the Lambda calculus, that's never the case. You're always reasoning about the term that's right in front of you. Uh, and with the row calculus, it's the same. Uh, you can reason locally. You can look at what's right in front of you. And, and what that does from a cognitive perspective is it allows the programmer to unburden herself of the, um, all, the extra, all the extra stuff that she was having to model in her head. Um, but it also means that static analysis of programs becomes more feasible because you have all of the dynamics are in the program text. You don't have to also analyze the state of the virtual machine. So that's, uh, and, and that carries over to the kinds of programs that uh, Wolfram would like to carry out, right? It's like we can get, if he had a structure function relationship, right, then um, it, the kinds of things he was generating wouldn't be nearly as mysterious because he could see um, how the generation process itself, uh, you know, um, unfolds as a result of the structure of the things that he's, you know, working on. So, so you know, I, I don't mean to be too harsh, but it, yeah, really I come from the the digital, you know, the digital physics. Uh, culture, <laughs> and uh, I know exactly what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I mean, I, 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 I fundamentally believe that that that's fruitful and interesting line of work. I have done lots of it myself, but but we really have to take on board um, <clears throat> the lessons of computer science. Like, like I think Wolfram wants to take on board some of the lessons of computer science. But if he's going to do that, he needs to take on board the rest and the much more subtle and important lessons of computer science. So, namely, the structure function relationships, compositionality, uh, and, uh, and um, um, by simulation. Like, once you get by simulation, then, then the, the, you know, the physics stuff really starts to come alive. Uh, because now you have a notion of, you can relate the, f like, like the, the issue is in physics, the principle is that we use experiment to verify, right? That's, that's the essence of physics. Um, we, we test 
theories by experiment, right? But where is that idea of testing encoded in physical theories? Where is the notion of probe encoded in physical theories? Well, these, these have to do with what are the observables, right? So for example, the observables <coughs> in a quantum system, right? Those are certain kinds of operators. Quantum causality. <coughs> um, so, yeah, so, um, uh, but, but there isn't a corresponding notion of how those observables um, fit together to give equivalences of systems. Right? And that's something that's really, really important. So let's, let's give examples. The traditional way in physics to write down the dynamics of a physical system is to write down some system of differential equations. Differential equations are the way that physicists capture state change. Here's a question for you. I give you one set of differential equations and say it models this system over here. And I give you another set of differential equations and say that models that system over there. And now I ask a basic question. Are these the same system? We, we, we have problems of scale, right? I mean, we don't know how to compare. We don't know how to compare, but by simulation gives you an answer to that, mm. right? If, <clears throat> so if you look at the case of chemistry, right? I've used this example many, many times. If you model the, dy the uh, dynamics of the reactions of some chemicals in a beaker, using differential equations. So let's say beaker A, and you model the dynamics of some chemical interactions in beaker B. And that gives you another system of differential equations. And now I pour the contents of A in and B into beaker C. Can I combine the two sets of differential equations to give me the dynamics of what's happening in beaker C? No, I have to start from scratch. If I model, then this much we know we can do. If I model um, beaker A with pi calculus uh, or the row calculus, and I model beaker B with uh, um, pi calculus or row calculus, then the model of what of pouring A and B into C is literally the model of A in parallel composition with the model of B. That's what I mean. That's yeah. a, that's a, I mean, <coughs> so, so if, if we use, say, Ken Lamba, Ken Lambda to uh, model A and B and then mix them, then we have a direct analog. Right. Of we have an, yeah, we have an analog in our model of what it means to combine systems. Right. Yeah. And that, is this? Go ahead. Uh, is this difficult if if we are thinking about graphs? Because uh, I was looking at lambda, and uh, their representation is is a graph, and this is very similar to 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 Wolfram's uh, representation of several automata as graph. And uh, is this really hard to? To, to look at the graph uh, and apply these rules. If you under, this is what I'm saying about the relationship of by simulation to compositionality. If you understand how um, the graph is generated um, in terms of the evolution of the system, so in terms of beta reduction, for example, um, and you understand how the terms are composed, then you can understand how the graphs are composed to give you the graphs you're interested in. If you don't have that relationship spelled out, then 
your your stuff or you're gonna have to reinvent it or rediscover it mm. All right. Well, thank you for interesting discussion. Um, I I think it'll be fun to you know. For I, I just really wish that Wolfram would talk to computer scientists. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that would that would be. A, a, I think that would that would really help his case. I I don't think he. You know, thinks anybody else is worth talking to. Well, that's a that's a whole other topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think he is. He's got it right that there's. Uh, there's a there's a, the power of iterated generation, is very impressive. Um, but the truth is that cellular automata um, really are rewrite systems, and this iterated generation really is a monad. Um, and so, if he understood um, that that much, um, then you know, he would go a, a lot would begin to happen, right? But there's, uh, there's definitely you know something, something missing from that whole uh, field. I mean, I loved a new kind of science when it came out. Um, but it suffered the same mill. Yeah, no, exactly. Which I thought the graphic lambda calculus spilled, but um, uh, until well, I, uh, I, 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 yeah, until, the, until I uh, saw yeah. the, uh, your stuff uh, in 2010 on the pi calculus. Yeah. <laughs> Still trying to put it together. You know, I, I sort of think that from the bottom up, the system is uh, graphic lambda calculus, and from the top down, it's uh, uh, pi calculus or row calculus. I think it's, I mean, it's, most people think that that relationship is reversed. The, the bottom is concurrent. Um, the, you can you can add constraints to get it to be sequential, and this is pretty much what happens in actual um, uh, chemical and biological systems. Everything is happening concurrently, willy nilly, and then biology works very very hard to get things to happen in sequence. Right, I mean that's what I'm saying. The, the uh, uh, at the bottom layer you have this chem lambda things just all bouncing around in, concurrently. And then you get systems that emerge from that. Right. But, um, well, maybe I need to look at Kim Lambda again, but uh, Lambda itself is fundamentally sequential. That's Barry's theorem. So right. Can, the, the, yeah. Well, the graph, graphic, calcul, graphic Lambda or Kim Lambda, which is Kim Lambda is just a variety of graphical Lambda. Uh -huh. um, is uh, you know that's uh, it's all concurrent. Uh, any uh, any uh, uh, transfer anywhere on the graph can be done. Any uh, rule can reduction can happen. Mm. Well, thank you. Very interesting. I guess it's almost time for the other meeting. I wanted. I was thinking of uh, joining. Um, I, uh, uh, there were some questions about the gossiping that was, I think, Nuts ever was talking about. And sure, we can talk talk about that. So, is is it? Uh, I'll I'll stop the recording now. Uh, hang on a sec. Um.